So good morning everybody again. My name is Aaron and this is Stephen. We also call him the professor as he is a professor of English. Am I getting that right? Yes. Okay. Ish. English, literature, etc. All right, and uh, we're very glad you're here. We are in uh, our second sermon ser- on our series of Biblical Blueprints, and today we're going to do something just a little different uh, than what we normally do in that. This isn't a typical sermon. This is more of a, a Q&A sermon, and what we mean by that is, is we want to engage you with questions and answers. So last week, Stephen gave us an introduction to kind of what the Bible is and what we should expect when we read the Bible, and this Sunday, we want to take a moment and say, really, we want to answer the question, should should I trust the Bible? Should I trust the Bible? Now, I want to pause for a second. Uh, up north, uh, uh, where we live, there's a tiny burb called Cotton Nettle. Anybody know where Cotton Nettle, Ohio is? All right, it's weird that you know that, Matt. All right, Cotton Nettle is uh, a place that you have to actually get lost to get there. It is the hometown of my parents where they met when they were in high school. And it it really is just a small little blurb unto itself. And it is the only place in the world that I know of that has a street that goes here and then suddenly moves over to the right 10 foot. And that is the street that my grandparents live on. But it was one of those roads where the farmer that owned the house on the corner said he wasn't giving up any of his land. And so the city voted that they would move the street 10 foot over when it got to his yard. Okay, if that gives you a little Mayberry understanding of what we're talking about, okay? Outside of that town is a small cemetery. And at the cemetery, there is a tombstone that has the name Chivington on it, which is my last name. And there, last year, almost about this time, exactly, we buried my grandmother beside my grandfather. And when we did that, When we had her funeral, we were able to proclaim that today we have lost grandma, we have lost mom, we have lost a dear friend, again, whatever your relationship was with her. But we proclaim the truth of the gospel, which is that we believe she gets to go home and see her heavenly father. She gets to be reunited with God. She gets to be rid of the pain, the scoliosis, the stomach issues that she had, the dementia she had. She is no longer suffering. She was no longer in trauma. She was no longer bound by the body that was slowly giving up on her. Now, as much as you and I live in a culture where we've done everything we can to say we're not aging, we're not getting old, and that we never go to funerals. Anytime anybody gets sick or old, we move them out of our sight and out of our homes, and so we ignore the reality that we're getting old until what? I wake up in the morning and I can't move my knees, right? Until suddenly I start looking at old photographs and go, who are the young kids in that photograph that got married? Oh, wait, that was us. Yes. All right. And then it strikes you one day that your kids are what? They're going off to college. And holy cow, how did that happen? Didn't we just have them yesterday? And then your parents start to take that shift where the people that you once thought were invulnerable and they're going to live forever now are dependent upon you to start to do some tasks around the house and care for the family. And the next thing you know, you're caring for them and trying to figure out how long you can keep them under your care and how much medical care they need and, and how are we going to care for dad and mom as their memory slips. Now again, we want to stay away from the idea that we, 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 we use the Bible as just an emotional crush. We want to stay away from the idea that, that hey, we're going to live forever. Well, the reality of it is, is that we don't live forever, and we turn to Scripture not as an emotional crush, but we turn to it saying that this is the very Word of God that we believe has ordered our lives and gives us reason for hope and reason to say this is not eternity, but that there is another life waiting for us. In fact, we gather every Sunday. And sometimes you read your Bible even after Sunday, right? Isn't that unique? Like, I read it on Tuesday and Wednesday as well. Why? Because we believe that it changes how we live. We live for hope. It gives us instructions for how to do relationships. It gives us instructions for how to raise kids. It gives us instructions for how we should behave ethically and morally. But we live in a culture... Well, the question, should I trust the Bible, is becoming more and more prevalent because we no longer live in a culture where Grandma said, believe in the Bible, and therefore we do. We live in a culture where it goes, 
Should I trust this book? Can I trust this book? How do I know I should trust this book? And it is a question that more and more in our culture are asking and that we today want to invite you to ask with us. Should I trust the Bible? Have you ever even thought of it? See, if you grew up in a church, you may never have even asked that. Should I trust the Bible? I don't know. Yeah, my, my mom and dad said we read it. If you didn't grow up in a church, you may be here this Sunday saying, I asked that question. Even if you grew up in a church, you may say, I... I'm asking the question today with you. I, this is a great question. I'm glad I hear it. Or, or maybe you saw something we did on social media and said, this is why I'm here, because I knew you guys were talking about this today. So what we want to do is I want to take just a moment, and if you're, not, if you're not already uncomfortable and squirming a little bit with the question, I want to make sure that you're really uncomfortable. That way you really want Stephen and I to give you some answers in a second. Okay, and what I want you to do is I want you to be able to ask and then answer the question, should I trust the Bible? So hopefully you're not sitting near people who are too scary. Okay? And if you are, it's your fault because you sat there and you didn't move when they moved, came and sat beside you. Okay? And so what we want to do is we want to give you permission to talk during the service, as we always do. And what we want you to do is we want you to turn to your neighbor and say, Should I trust the Bible? And then we want you to wait for your neighbor to give you the answer. Alright? Because again, most of us haven't thought about this question. So we're going to play the game right now. You ready? Again, it's going to be a little different church service. We want you to engage each other and say, should I trust the Bible? And then wait for your neighbor to give them an answer. And just, just say, hey, that was a great answer. And then your turn. Okay? Because we don't want your friend to be the only one in the hot spot. We want you to be there too. Okay? You got the question? Should I trust the Bible? You ready? We got about two minutes. Okay? Ready? Go. Are you uncomfortable with this question, Stephen? Not as much as I was. Yeah. So here's what we know. Again, we just wanted to make you a little uncomfortable, or at least attempt to. And, and here's what we saw, at least in the first service, a little dark, so it was hard to gauge here. But we saw people turn, why should I trust the Bible? And then look back at us and just wait. I was like, we know you're going to answer. Uh, and here's the problem. As most of us haven't really thought about it. Okay? Now, from a biblical perspective, 1 Peter 3.15 says, We should always be prepared to give a reasonable defense for our faith. We should always be able to say to someone, This is why I believe what I believe, not just because Grandma told me so. The other piece of that is, is again, the mission of the church is to move people closer to Jesus. We exist for those who don't know Jesus already. And so we need to be able to say to people, I believe in the Bible because when they ask. And so those two things have led us to where we're at today with the sermon. Now, I want to affirm one thing today. We are not the church that has all the answers, nor are we afraid of you asking questions. So, Stephen, is it okay to have doubts and questions? Absolutely. In fact, I think anymore we'll find that doubts are the default when we go out there and when we share our testimony, share our faith, we will find, in many instances, a skeptical audience. Whereas before, it would have been, oh, well, you just invite them to church because they're new and they'll come. Now, I always have that concern, like, what if they have big questions? And I've just told them the most important thing is, I want to get you to church. Yeah, the first step in encountering someone who doesn't already know Jesus isn't, hey, will you come to church with me? It's, let's build a relationship. 
And there may be things that block you or keep you from experiencing Jesus that we should talk about long before you even go. And we actually believe that doubt is, is not a bad thing. It's healthy. Here. It, it is very healthy, and we actually, a lot of what this comes from, I was reflecting after the first service, because someone asked me, how did you get to know this? Are you so smart? And I realized a lot of this is because I was doubting. A lot of the answers that I... I wouldn't start searching for answers. I wouldn't have expanded my faith. I wouldn't have learned about the reasons behind what we believe if I hadn't first doubted. And so doubt, can, God can use for good things. And that this sermon in many ways is a, an outpouring of the blessing that doubt has been in your life and in mine. Right, right. Now, before we begin, here's just a, a thought for you. Again, we want to encourage you to ask questions. Uh, those of you that are live, you can raise your hand, you can wave at us, and we will try to catch that, and we will try to take your question right here. You can also tweet those at Fairborn UMC, and uh, I think Megan's going to help me out. She's going to try to capture some of those and make sure that those come back to me in a text uh, so that I'm not trying to scroll through Twitter as we're up here. Uh, so you can, you can even tweet those. Those of you that are watching online, again, you can tweet it or you can also go to our Fairborn UMC Facebook page and we'll try to cover those. Uh, so at any point in time you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and go, got a question, uh, and we'll try our best to answer that to the best of our abilities. But we don't have all the answers. No. In fact, again, as Stephen said, most of our answers come from people who, us, who are going, hey, we've doubted, we've had questions, we've researched it, here's what we know. So, let's start out. Uh, our question, let me get my phone out so I don't miss Megan. I'll tell you, he's on Facebook. Uh, so, uh, Stephen, what is the Bible? You covered that last week, but give us a, a, just a brief recap before we get too far into this. All right, if Aaron's asking me what the Bible is, I think I'm going to have to carry the weight of this. Sir. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, the Bible is a collection of books. Oftentimes we think of it as just one book. We call it the good book, but it's an anthology of 66 books. They span poetry, they span history, they span biography, there's philosophy, there's theology. Uh, there's all sorts of books in here, many different writers, many different writing styles, written over 1,500 to 2,000 years. But one of the things that's remarkable about it is how consistent the message is focused because it's all focused and leading up to the Gospels and that's one of the reasons why we say we, we can trust it because it is so focused and leads up to that main point the books before the Gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John where we hear the story of Jesus they all tell us why we need Jesus they set the stage for his coming they explain the religion and the beliefs of the Jewish people and the history of the Jewish people and then we read the Gospels we know who Jesus is we understand why he came and then after that we get philosophy and theology helping to explain what that meant what that means for our lives now how that should change the way that we live and so all of it is focused around those four books about the life of Jesus the death of Jesus and his resurrection yeah. So there's 66 books, some by the same author. And so if I'm someone who, again, doesn't know the Bible, or I'm someone who says, you know what, my life took a rough turn, and suddenly God doesn't feel very close. Like I used to feel like God was with me, and all of a sudden this happened and this happened. Mom died. Uh, my, my dad got dementia. There was a car wreck that killed my daughter. Again, life situation happened. And now I start to question the truth of the scripture. One of the, the things that I want to do is I want to go back into reason all right, and, and, and study and say, how do I know I can trust this book? How do we know that we have in this book what was originally written? How do we know that's what the people who originally wrote the books of the Bible, all 66 of them, how do we know that we have what they originally wrote? It hasn't been changed over time. So th this question is really one about transmission. How did it start with the ancient Jewish people and get to us you know, 2,000, 4,000 years later. And they started, and, and so many people, this is a big hang-up for them. They believe that it's almost like a giant game of telephone through about six different languages. And now I've, I've translated, I've studied a couple of ancient languages, and so I can say that's not quite how this works. First of all, even if we were to have translated the whole thing through and gone through all those languages, that doesn't mean we can't understand it now. Just for fun, I put John 3.16 through Google Translate about six times. Which is like For next God's, to the Bible, yeah. right? Google. Mm -hmm. Google Translate. Right. 
Uh, so this is to establish a baseline. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten sons that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So here is it after going through modern Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, French, and finally English. So this is translated through each one of those each languages of from the other language. Yes. Okay, wow. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who, by a man, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. So it's very similar. But even then, this is not how we actually translate scripture. No, we didn't go from translation to translation to translation. No, we didn't start with Hebrew and go to Greek and then to the Latin Vulgate and then to the King James Version. And then we, that's not how we did things. Uh, what it is, it starts as oral stories, an oral tradition that would have been passed down at about the 10th century B.C. B.C., before Christ. Before Christ. It's finally written down. And once it's been written down, it's a little easier to trace how it got to us because they would have had these, these written. They would have had these um, in synagogues and at the temple and they would have read from them over time. So uh, here's the question then. You say, so they started writing them down about 10 BC. How do we know that, again, over time we didn't change the translation as it was written? What, what is it evidence that we have? And, and of course that takes us to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's exactly where I was going to go with it is the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is a fantastic historical discovery. The people of Qumran, during the Roman conquering of Israel, had hidden scrolls away. And we found them. There are hundreds of scrolls, about 22% of them are books of the Bible. And we have a copy of just about every Old Testament book of the Bible in these jars, as well as just a ridiculous amount of original writings that tell us so much about what life in first century Israel was like. We have many different copies and these dates span, do we have a slide about yeah, that? Go to the next slide guys. Yeah, so, so real quick, uh, prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest complete, let me be clear with that one because I don't want people to go, wait a second, I don't understand. The earliest entire complete uh, a book uh, that we used to, to get our translation of the Bible was from 1008 A.D. All right? That's the earliest complete translation. We're not talking about the fragments of the Gospels or the books isolated we have. That was the earliest complete book of the Bible. So then we did have a discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, all right? and that dates those books all the way to 250 B.C. to 68 A.D. Okay, and so it makes this huge jump in time, all right, and here's what we found. Up to 99% accuracy from what we had today to the first codex, the Leningrad codex we had, to the scrolls found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 99% accuracy well, in a transmission of time. What's that 1% difference is largely spelling errors and changes in the language. They said the same thing a different way. They forgot I after E except after C. I don't even I do understand that anymore. I do so. teach English. Yeah. Uh, but they, it was spelling errors. It was nothing that made us say, oh my goodness, there's an extra chapter at the end of 2 Samuel where, Jesus, where uh, David renounces God. We don't find the chapter where it says, God's not real. Flood never happened. We made it all up. There's no big shell shock discovery. The big discovery, the amazing thing, was that it was the same. That there weren't those changes. And 1,000 years of history didn't alter the transmission at all. It wasn't interrupted. There was no, it was never hijacked by politics. It was never changed by those in power it stayed the same because it was always something that was seen as holy and set apart. All right. All right. So this is a, a first question we got that, that we're going to take a shot at. All right. Should the foundation of my faith come from my experience, feelings, thoughts, or the Bible? And so in the Methodist Church, we call this the quadra quadrilateral. That's a tough word to say. It's one of the hard ones. It's a tongue twister word, quadrilateral. And here's the idea. All right, we know what we know because of our experience, all right, because of reason, because of tradition, and because of Scripture. So those are the four things that are part of how we know what we know. 
Alright? You walked outside, you saw a bird fly, you say, my experience says birds can fly, my reason goes, birds must use their wings to fly. Alright? Again, you can say tradition has taught us this, and we can look back in scripture and say there's not much about birds other than God created them. Alright? And they fly. But here's the way we do this when we suddenly become to an ethical or moral issue. Okay? We go, hey, what if my experience, or what if my reason, or even the tradition of the church goes against what scripture says? And so here's what we believe. We believe that Scripture is foundation and that the other three follow. Because here's what we know. We know that our culture suddenly becomes, what do we all vote for? And what we vote for may not be the morals or ethical laws that God has set forth and established. So Scripture always trumps my experience and my reason in the sense of my reason or my experience may not fit in with Scripture. It is the base that we return to. You know, we, we talked about doubts, and many people in here may have doubts. You may be here because you're searching, and this is a good place to start. But oftentimes, when we do rely on those feelings, on just what we believe, on what we've seen, we set up a standard and a belief system that is subjective rather than objective. Using the big words yeah, again. Yeah, so let me... Subjective means that I'm going to believe this because of my experience, because I want to, because of what I have seen. It is, But object doesn't refer to what the person sees, it refers to the object that's there. So it's not based on you, it's based on what's outside of you. All right. and, and the Bible helps to provide a mostly objective, I, and I say mostly because there are different ways people will translate it. None of them affect the core tenets of Christianity, but there are theological discussions about how the atonement worked, about the first seven days of creation. You know, All those things like that, essential. That, yeah, that are important, but we would say not a salvation issue. But what we come to is that there is a something outside of us that we use to establish and set our beliefs. Yeah. A, a good way to think about this is uh, everybody remember when you were in high school and somewhere in high school you found that person you were going to marry and you had your kids named and you knew where you were going to live and you had your future all mapped out for you, right? Because that's what you were experiencing and reason and rationale said, yep, this is what we're going to do, right? And tradition, you said my parents got married and they, they met each other in high school so therefore this is the way it should work out. Now, again, this is an oversimplification of everything that we're talking about but then what happened? That broke up and you found that, oh my gosh, that my plan, what I thought, what I felt wasn't quite true. And then you got married one day and you went, you know, I was in love, but it, was a, it wasn't the eternal, like, hey, this is the one I'm going to get married to love. And so, again, what we're just saying is that there's something bigger, something objective that stands out here saying, hey, there is truth beyond what we feel. All right, so Stephen, let me crawl back into this because uh, one of the questions I have then is, is does the story of the Bible, is it mythologized? Uh, is it embellished? How do I know that like, hey, the disciples didn't say, hey, we're going to start making up this idea of the resurrection or that they, they didn't steal the body, as Matthew says, and then it became a resurrection story. How do I know that what happened is actually what happened? Well, there's actually a really good answer for that. That's a great question. Because we can look at it and we can say, okay, this is, this seems like unbelievable stuff, right? And we would say, you know, but we know that because there's a natural law, there's the way things tend to work, and a miracle, by necessity, interrupts that. Dead people tend to stay dead. Well, but what we have with the resurrection is someone saying, no, we believe that this was interrupted and that Jesus was risen from the dead here. So it's, I understand the skepticism there, and I think it's healthy. And what we need to say, though, is look at when these were written. These were written a little conservatively within 10 to 40, 10 to 60 years of Jesus' death. Right. That is not enough time for a legend to spread because you still have the majority of the people that were alive when it was written there to contradict it. Right. Uh, eyewitnesses were there to say that did or it did not happen. People tend to think of the church now and take that idea and put it then. Which means now the church is a big organization. We're a popular organization. In many ways we're a powerful organization when it comes to shaping public opinion and getting our story out there. But we weren't then. You could see how we could maybe change something now, but 
there were the Roman leaders that didn't want to see this happen. There were the Jewish leaders that didn't want to see this story get out. It would have been very easy for them to show a body, to squash this story, except that they couldn't. They didn't do that. The church at this point in time was not a powerful organization. It was a persecuted grassroots movement. Right. And so when we talk about, hey, how short of a time frame after the resurrection did Jesus, the, the, the Gospels get written, did the stories of Jesus were they put as we have them today? Uh, the answer again is anywhere between uh, 10 to 50 years. And, and, and here's how we know that, okay? There are, there are multiple reasons we know that, but my favorite is uh, the temple, okay? The temple is destroyed in AD 70, 71, okay? Somewhere in, in that time frame, uh, there's a siege on Jerusalem. The Romans come and they destroy the temple. Now, let me help you understand what a big deal that was. Say you're writing American history, okay? Anybody like history? All right, two of you, great. Excellent. The rest of you are writing something you hate, okay, American history, and you're governing a 10-year time frame, 2010 to 2020. What are one or two events you have to have in your history from that time period, 2010 to 2020? What's one or two events you have to include in your story? 9-11. Right? I mean, we could talk about presidents, we could talk about laws, we could talk about social issues, wars. But 9-11 is the one event that every one of us will go. If I'm writing history 2010 to 2020, I have to have. Because of its impact upon our culture and upon our nation. Right? The only other thing that's comparable is Pearl Harbor. Okay? What's he saying? Oh, sorry. You're 10 years off. 10 years off. Sorry. Go back. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. It's a good thing we share our notes with John. Yeah, man. All right. And so you have to include 9-11 in, in your history of the United States. And I get so excited, my brain starts working well, fast. If you were writing 10 years now, it's was such a big event that it may influence us. Right. You have still to have include. the remnants of that, and we still discuss the repercussions of that. What's not included, then, in any of our Gospels is what? the destruction of the temple. Not there. It's not in any book we have in the New Testament. Which is really ironic since Jesus actually predicted that it would happen. So the disciples or the writers of the Gospels could actually say, oh, and by the way, just as Jesus predicted, the temple was destroyed. And so it would be something that they would want to add because it validates the words that Jesus gave. But instead, we see this huge absence. We see an absence in the books that talk about the major apostles like Paul and Peter. None of them talk about their death. Why? Because the books don't have that ending because it didn't happen yet. And so all the books we have in the New Testament, again, there are many, many arguments to give these early datings, all right, are all written within 10 to 15 years post-resurrection while the eyewitnesses are still there. That says to me that there's not, not enough time to make this a myth or to embellish the story. So Stephen, take us into this idea that there's a reliability of the New Testament. This is really good. I'm glad we got a literature guy here to help us understand this. This, this chart's really cool. So, what we see here is a chart that looks at two things. It looks at the gap in years between our original copies and our first surviving copies. Now, I want to make clear this is copies so we may just have scraps of something, just a fragment. We aren't talking a whole text here. Uh, but, as we just said, if there is a small gap, it means it likely hasn't been built on. It likely hasn't been made a legend yet. And, what, and so we we're looking for a small number here. What we have with some of the other most reliable ancient texts is, uh, let's see, for Demosthenes and Herodotus, 1,400 years. Were you reading those yesterday, John? You were reading Demosthenes, right? No. Oh. Okay. Okay. The New Testament is a 25-year gap between the events happening in the New Testament, between the original manuscripts, and when we start seeing copies of these manuscripts. This is amazing because Paul's letters were circulated. So they would take one, one, and he would send it to the church in, say, Corinthians, and then the church of Corinthians would copy it, and they'd start sending it to other churches. Which means we also have a ridiculous number of manuscripts that help establish, you know, like we just said with the Dead Sea Scrolls. When we have a number, a lot of manuscripts, we can look at them and we can say, 
oh wow, we have all these manuscripts, and they agree. Or, the, like, or they have all these changes and they've embellished the story, yes. which is not do, the case with Scripture. What we don't see is changes. Right. We see consistency throughout all of them. And so the bottom graph here is the number of manuscripts we have. Yeah, and you'll see that squiggly line because if this was in a book, in order to show the number of copies of scraps of full books of the New Testament, we would have to make this page a fold-out. We would have to keep going if we were to actually draw that line out to the same scale as all the others. It's like a picture book. I'm excited. I'd read it now. You turn the page and there's yeah. just a line that says 5,686. All right, so uh, the next piece of liter literary evidence that we have actually comes from a, a practice called literary criticism. But that right. would actually be a test for history. A test for historicity. Okay, so explain this to us. So what we have is there are a number of criteria that we can set up that will tell us help us determine whether or not something was real, that whether or not they're trying to do history, whether they're not they're trying to be accurate with what they're telling us. Now the first one is historical congruence. Does it match the other things that we have from that time? Does it match what we know about that time? And what's amazing is that when we read, when historians read the Gospels, when they read Acts, the, the books that are trying to do history, they look at them and they say, the only way they could have known that this person was in this place is if they were writing it at the time. Histories hadn't been spread around by the time we found this document. The only way they could have known that is if they were there. Yeah. It, it is interesting. Uh, studies have been done on the book of Acts, just the book of Acts. There are 79 historical uh, time cultural sensitive events that when historians study the book of Acts they go this person had to be there. There are details about ocean and sea, uh, excuse me, sea patterns, not ocean patterns, but sea patterns. There are details about boats and ships. There are details about islands, people and places that when historians study they go this is a book that you actually have to believe because of all the details they got right in history which then forces historians to go if this person was right about all these details then probably they were right about the message that they were communicating in fact historians use the book of Acts as a blueprint to study history of the Mediterranean era era and so what we know from that is that that's what they were trying to do they were trying to be accurate because we have, and this is our second criteria, independent and early attestation. What does that mean? That means, let's say you see a car accident and there are three witnesses that were there when it happened. You are going to be able to get the main idea of what happened when you interview each of those witnesses separately. Because they were there early, they were there as it happened. Someone that walks by on the street a week later isn't going to be able to tell you anything about that car accident. And they're independent. If one says, if one says, oh, I saw the black car swerve, I saw the blue car swerve, I saw the green car swerve. What we know is that one car swerved in front of another. The colors changed, but we still know the basic fact that the one car swerved in front of the other one. Which is huge because this is one of the arguments that people use against Scripture. They're like, hey, was, was it just Mary that went to the tomb? Was it these three ladies? Was it a group of ladies? And what we do is we go... Yeah, we know that Scripture doesn't always agree with the number or who all the ladies were that went. What we know is that there were ladies who were at the tomb who were the first witnesses. And people go, see, you can't believe the Bible because you don't know all the women that were there. Where I go, actually, it gives the Bible credibility. We know that there were women there. We just don't know who all they were. It, it gives us that, that again, independent attestation. At, at, how do you say it? I, I'm just going to go on and Okay, say everybody it. knows what I meant. It's on the screen. It's on the, that one. Attestation. There that we go. One. I got it. Number two. And that actually brings us to number three, which is the criterion of embarrassment. Because if you wanted to make up a story, I would make up the story that me and my 12 buddies, the 12 apostles, we went and we stormed the two Roman guards that were there. We rolled the stone away ourselves and found that there was no body. Now, don't we look super impressive? Don't you want to follow us? And we're really strong. Beat some Roman soldiers up. But that's not what we have. Right. They it's send the least believable people. Women. Are the messengers. Now, ladies. This we is, aren't saying you're the least believable This is no people. fault against you today. It was the belief at the time. Stephen and I are both married. We want to be able to go home and talk to our yeah, wives. we want to stay married. Yeah. 
Right. But at Jesus' time, women didn't even have a voice in court. So if someone was at Jesus' day, a contemporary of Jesus, reading the story, and they get to the point that, wait a second, your whole message is built on the fact there were a bunch of ladies that saw this happen? If they wanted to make something up, they would have made it the people that were opposed to Jesus, or they would have made it, they discovered it, and, or you know, the people, they would have tried to make it trustworthy, they would have made it a very believable source, and it was not a believable source at the time this was written. In fact, the rest of the criteria are on the screen, but we want to stay with this one just for a moment because it's the fun one to work with. So again, the idea that there are embarrassing stories that we would have had to write about ourselves, okay? Again, we would not make them up. The disciples are about as dim-witted as you can come in the Bible, okay? Every time you turn around, the disciples are clueless, they're dumb, they don't get it. Jesus is saying stuff to them like, what's wrong with you guys, All right? In fact, at one time, he even calls Satan, excuse me, Peter Satan. Right? If I'm Peter and I'm writing the book, I'm leaving that part out for sure. <laughs> no, we're not including the part where Jesus actually called me the devil. You know what's funny and, and embarrassing as well is that while the women were going out and going to help prepare Jesus' body for burial and put perfume there so that the smell yeah. didn't stink. Where were our heroes? They were huddled scared in a room because they thought, oh, they're going to come after us next. So while the women are going out and they're being brave, we actually say, then they tell us we were scared in a room, afraid to leave it. And then Jesus says weird stuff that didn't even make sense. Like, hey, this is my body, eat it. And this is my blood, drink it. Apparently he wanted us all to become vampires and zombies. That's what I read. Right. right. And so even the people at Jesus' day were like, what are we reading? Like, I don't get this, right? Because why? It's an embarrassing, it's an awkward detail that we would not have ever made up unless Jesus said, hey, this is what I want to have happen. You'd want to make his message look appealing to bring the most people to you if you were seeking power or making this up. And actually what we find after that story is it says, this was a hard teaching and many people left. Right. We actually, he lost followers, which so we say, well, he's not just trying to blow smoke in our face. He's trying to deliver something that's true that they don't want to hear. Right. All right, so, again, we've got tons more information, but I want to get to a couple questions we have. Uh, first of all, is it okay to just believe? Yes, uh, uh, but yes, no. <laughs> yeah, um, so what, what you'll find is that it is okay to just believe until you get the first inkling of doubt. Or until I have a friend who asks me a question. Mm -hmm. And again, I need to be able to say, this is why I believe. It's more than a feeling. It's more than just what I grew up with. No, Megan does the songs, yeah. not us. Right. All right, so the, the second question we have. How can we take the message of the Bible and affect our culture? It seems that our culture is changing, affecting the Bible's message. Now we're back to the subjective and, and where you were at earlier. So let me, just, let me just take one example and we'll play it out for just a little bit, okay? okay. And let's, let's use one that's going to be pretty easy for us to wrap our head around, not too controversial, not that we're afraid of those, but this one's easy, okay? Human value. Does human life have value? Does human life have value? Now again, we're living in, a, in an age where we're starting to question some of that. What do we do with people when they reach a certain age of, hey, they've got dementia, hey, they're on life support. We reach a, a point in time where we're talking about embryonic research and stem cell research. And so all these questions have huge impacts and it's a fringe areas and fringe questions. And at the core of it, does human life have value. And the reason why this question is so important is because in our culture, you and I both know someone who has thought about committing suicide or who has committed suicide, right? I mean, you have a friend who has thought about that. You may not even know they've thought about that, but you probably have a friend who, if you don't know them, they know someone who has already not only attempted but succeeded at committing suicide because at the core of their belief system, our culture says you don't have value unless you can dunk a basketball, hit a home run, write a popular song and be on stage, you have a big doctorate after your name with lots of letters. Or you've assigned that value to a relationship, to another person, to a status that you have and that you've then lost. And you're wearing the right clothes, you know how to be popular. Again, unless you have these things, our culture says you don't have value. And so does the Bible oppose that? Yeah. Why? Because it says we were created in whose image? God's. God's image, right? 
not the image You're of welcome everyone that was an easy yeah. one right not not the image of, of, of some brand name not the image of whatever your friend says about you that this is who you are now you were created in God's image so we can stand against culture and say that's not who I am whatever label you gave me that's not who I am I am created in the image of God and that doesn't change that's one of those objective things that no matter what we find in our culture no matter what we feel uh, it doesn't change the fact that we are of value because we have a creator who made us to have value and I want to go back briefly to some of what we talked about last week. How do we know what, the, what is biblical and objective versus how do we know what society is trying to tell us that the Bible says? Go to the context. Look at what else is there. Don't, immediate, don't even immediately believe what we're telling you about the Bible. Go and look at it for yourself. That is how we come to that objective reasoning. You know, what does it tell what would it mean to those people? Never read a Bible verse. What does what it meant for them mean to me? Those questions help us avoid getting the popular societal message that they're telling us the Bible says. It helps get to us to what the actual Bible says. Yeah. Now, why is this important? Well, Jesus makes a statement that is absolutely true. He says, man and woman. He says man, but we are able to understand it translates both genders, right? All right? Man does not live on bread alone. And what he's saying is that, that yeah, you have food that you physically take into your body, but if you don't take in something more, that you are spiritually starving. And when he makes a statement, he is referring to the Scriptures. He is saying that there is a spiritual food that you and I are hungry for. And here's what happens. In our culture today, these stupid things help keep us so busy. And our televisions keep us so busy. And our schedules that we feel like we have to fill up or else we are not of value. We're not good parents. We're not doing what's right. If we don't fill those so full of things that we never have time to notice our spiritual hunger, we're failing. And here's what happens. is suddenly we get a call from a doctor. We get a call from a police officer. We get a call from your mother saying your father has fallen and you're going to rush into the hospital. He may have something seriously wrong. We get that call and suddenly we are awakened to our spiritual starvation that we have been suffering. It is something within us that longs for the word of God that we understand that it is manna. It is bread from heaven that is deeper. It is the word of God. That when I do a funeral, it is the reason that nobody says to me, Hey, will you read this rhyme from Mother Goose at the gravesite? Instead, people say to me when I'm at the hospital or I'm at the funeral, Hey, will you give us some form of hope? And we're able to read Psalm 23. We're able to read John 14. It says, In my Father's house there are many, many rooms, and He's got one for you. It is the food that sustains your daily life. When you are the single mother or the single father and you feel like you are oppressed and you are out of juice and you are all alone, you read the scripture and you see Jesus promise, I have never abandoned or forsaken you and you go because my God did that, I will never do that to my kids. It is to the married couple who goes, I'm ready to give up, I'm ready to toss into town. We, can't, we don't like each other, we hate what we're going through. And then we go, let's turn to the scripture and say, what did Jesus do? And Jesus says, I love my bride so much that when she hated me, when she cursed me, when she threw stuff at me, when she killed me, I died willingly for her and then forgave her. And so when should you stop forgiving your spouse? Jesus says when you've given your life for her, you and I might have a conversation then. And so my marriage must go on. It is to the teenager who's holding some form of weapon, wanting to do themselves harm, that the scripture cries out, you are of sacred worth. You don't understand the, God, the plan that God has for you. Don't do this. God has a plan for you. It is to the child who has suffered abuse and neglect and who sits in the corner of her room or his room and goes, does anybody care? And we recall the song that says, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? The Bible tells me so. This is why we read the Scripture. Because it impacts every decision we make from who we should marry, who we should date, where I should go to school, what kind of job I should want, how I should care for my family, how I should care for my kids, how I should care for myself. What should I do on Sunday morning? It impacts every decision we have. 
and changes life. Because we believe it's not just printed black and white on a book. It is a living word that the Holy Spirit uses to transform the heart and change our mind. So we got one more part of the sermon series next week. So again, we've gone three parts. Next week, we're really going to crawl into some scripture. I don't want you to miss it, okay? Again, it's a three-part sermon. If you missed last week, you can go on YouTube and, and, and check out uh, Mr. Bush's sermon. And this is today. we got one more. We don't want you to miss next week's sermon all right, as we finish up our series on the Bible. And, and I just want you to know, we hope that when we're done today, as we finished up, you go, I can tell someone why, sh- why they should read the Bible. Or at least why I read the Bible. And I could tell them it's not because grandma told me so. It is because of this. That I believe that it is actual stories from the people of God who wrote them down. And it is a message from God to me and to our culture even today. And it has the power to save lives. If we didn't get to your question, we will continue looking at it. We will get to it sometime, hopefully in the next week or two, whether that's through a Facebook live chat or through some sort of blog post. We'll, we won't just sit on those and say, oh, well, to have texted it sooner. Yeah. All right, will you pray with me? God, uh, we believe in your word. We believe in the historical reliability and transmission of your word. We believe because of reasonable faith, because of reasonable evidence. But Father, it is still a faith in which we take a leap and say we believe that you are the God who came back from the dead. And Father, today I pray that that faith has been uh, firmed up. I pray that our faith has been challenged. And I pray that you move us out of here going, I should read this book over and over and over and over again and more and more and more because it is the word of God. Lord Jesus, may these changes be about us because of that. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, now I hope you don't wait till next week before you read your Bible. I hope that you go, hey, this is a book that has the power to change lives, and I'm going to crawl into it because I want to know what God says to me. Next week we're going to close up our series on why we should read the Bible, and I hope you're going to be back. Until then, let me give you a blessing. In the name of God the Father, who lived, who died, and was resurrected, may you go forth saying, I believe, not because I feel like it, not because Grandma told me so, but all of that, but because my faith is a reasonable faith with amazing evidence that leads me to the truth of Jesus Christ. Fall upon this, and you will be saved. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you are blessed. Amen. Amen.